So growing your revenue is consistently thinking through your unit economics and building a model so that you have enough cash flow to profitably finance the next marginal customer. I'd start with a three-year goal, three, two, and one. If a three-year is what I'd like to be, two years is what I, I should be, and then the first year would be, this is absolutely what I need to be. And then when you think about growing your revenue, think about the mix of inorganic and organic. So how much demand do you want to spend on any of the marketing channels? And how much do you really want to focus on organic growth? Hello, and welcome to the Upflip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Freeman. And on this episode, I'm talking to Matt Hewlett, CEO and president of PetMed Express. PetMed sales were declining when Matt took over, but in 10 short months, he's turned them from a struggling business into a success story with an eight-figure monthly revenue. This isn't Matt's first time leading a company to revenue growth. In his more than 30 years in business, he served as president of well-known companies like Rosetta Stone and Expedia. Now he's sharing his insights on how to start and grow an online business with our listeners. Ready to hear his advice? Let's go meet Matt. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to have this uh, interview today. So let's let's get started off with with the background. I, I mean, how long have you been the CEO and president of PetMed Express? And and talk us through some of those other businesses you've worked with in the past. This is the first CEO role I've had as a public company CEO, but I've been a CEO multiple times for private businesses and a president a couple of times for public companies. And I've been with Pet Meds for about a year. And it seems like it's been five years, but it's only been a year, unbelievably. And to answer your question, you know, throughout my career, I primarily over the last 30 years have done transformation. So usually fixing and growing a business, some businesses that your listeners may know, like Expedia, Real Networks, Rosetta Stone, and a bunch of private companies that have been backed by venture capitalists like Sequoia Capital and Allen & Company. So really the theme for me has been always transformations. And in that spirit of transformation, what was the biggest problem facing PetMed Express when you came in as the CEO? Yeah. And to be honest, to be blunt and succinct, underinvestment and lack of strategy. And you typically see that for a business like PetMed that's been around for 26 years, that usually you see these founding teams that are very entrepreneurial, have some edge, some instinct, some insight into a business where that business grows. But it's very hard for them to cannibalize themselves and come up with that second act. So underinvestment and lack of strategy. And so what were the what were the big changes you made initially to to sort of immediately address that problem? Yeah. And I'm a big fan of really focusing on the people first without scaling through people, without having the right people at the right stage of business. Really, you don't get any momentum. And so really was focusing on the team, in some cases, new team members, focusing on the strategy, getting a strategy so we could start executing to be a growth business again. And then really, once we've locked on those two things, implement process and product to really be able to execute on that. And just to kind of give our, our listeners a sense of what that, that growth at PetMed has been, can you give us a sense of what the average monthly revenue was before you joined and, and where it's at today? Yeah, it was declining. And I would say now it's about flat. You know, we do about $20 million a month, profitable, you know, 10% profit margins, gross margins around 28, 29%. And so, you know, when you're doing turnarounds, sometimes flat is the new up. And so you kind of start with flattening and then, you know, hopefully knock on wood, we'll start seeing some quarters in the future where you start seeing year over year growth. And this, this you've, you've made mention here, this isn't the first company you've helped do this kind of work with. Um, can you kind of talk a little bit more generally about the steps you, you take to identify issues or problems within a business when you come in to, to help make that turnaround happen? Yeah. And over the years, I've kind of developed my own FICO score, you know, for determining the strength of a transformation, how likely it can be turned around. And I have a shorthand for it. I call it T3PM, TAM, Timing, Track Record, Plan, and Momentum. And I kind of score a business and, and generally the hardest things to fix in a business. And I would argue it's almost like Darwinian physics that it's difficult, too difficult to fix is the total addressable market and timing. If those two things aren't going your way, it's very hard to uh, figure out how to turn around a business. And what I typically look for, as long as I know there's a big addressable market over a billion dollars and the timing's right, meaning you're not like MySpace when Facebook started taking over, then you really have the ability to look at the plan, the people, the investment. And so I, I tend to like engage in companies that have big addressable markets, the timing's on their side. And then we can figure out the team and the capital to grow the business. What are the kind of the key insights that you, that you might be looking for in a company and, and why are those important? And how do you identify what those might be? 
Yeah, I look for businesses that have some unique insight, kind of a secret. You know, for instance, in, when, you, when you have a big addressable market, for example, if you're in the payment space, just give you an example, not with the pet industry. And, you know, years ago, you'd look at the addressable market for the payment space. You're thinking to yourself, boy, there's probably too many vendors in that space. And when Stripe came out and said, hey, we have an insight that mobile application development is going to be big. Startups are a place to focus. I think most people legitimately and probably honestly would have written them off. And so I look for businesses that have a big addressable market, but are really good at identifying whether it's a key firmographic type of company, a vertical or a type of consumer, something where they can identify a small but growing niche that they can exploit as a key unlock. I think that is a really important part of figuring out how to unlock value to business. Can you talk a little bit more about specifically about why it is so important to identify that niche? Yeah, and I think too many entrepreneurs of any size, big or small, tend to, and I love entrepreneurs. My wife's an entrepreneur. I'm entrepreneurial, but I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't have I don't have the guts to be an entrepreneur. What I mean by that is entrepreneurs have to almost look at data and reality and admit that it doesn't exist. And they often look at all the opportunities as the back of the bowling pins versus looking at the first bowling pin to hit. And so the, the, the reason why it's important is you have limited time, limited capital. So you have to focus your efforts on something that you can be good at, a unique sales proposition, a feature, a capability, maybe a flaw in the bigger competitor's business model that you see, something that you can focus on so you can start getting your first set of customers. Then and only then can you expand. In just a second here, I want to kind of use your knowledge as a, as a turnaround expert to, to look at the beginning of companies and what, what somebody who's starting out should do to avoid needing a turnaround expert. But I just want to remind our listeners that if you're if you're looking for an online business of your own, you can head to upflip.com to check out the current listings of businesses for sale there. So so Matt, to kind of get started, if, if someone's just starting their online business, what are some of the things that they should do from the beginning to make sure there's they're not only set up to succeed in the early days, but to eventually scale? Yeah. And I guess let's go back to what we just talked about. Start with a niche. Everything that you do from copywriting to your homepage should reinforce a very simple USP, unique sales proposition, and don't spend a lot of money and hustle. And so, you know, focusing on sales, focusing on those core group of customers, providing an invaluable service. Some tech startup entrepreneurs call that product market fit. I just call that really finding those evangelists, those core evangelists. Those are the key things to do. And I think entrepreneurs that aren't scrappy, maybe spend too much money where they don't need to. And some entrepreneurs are too scrappy. They don't scale when they need to. And you'll know it. You'll know when you have something working, when your reorders are high and people are knocking at your digital door for your product and service. But I'd focus on the niche, simple USP, don't spend a lot of money and really, really focus on those core customers and really focus on that reorder right, reorder rate and figure out why they're reordering. Do you have any tips for a new business owner in finding a niche and and perhaps identifying a niche that will be profitable? Yeah. And I spent a bunch of time in my career trying to money ball that. And in fact, I wrote a book recently that that I interviewed a bunch of entrepreneurs. For example, the gentleman that started Rovio, the game company that started Angry Birds. You kind of you can't you kind of talk to these entrepreneurs and they always say oh, that's serendipity. You can't quantify it. I think there actually are some things you can look at. I tend to look th- at things like for consumer businesses, I look for high interest, but low CAC. So you can use tools like SCM Rush or SpyFu. There's a bunch of products that you can get for free accounts and look for things related to the niche that you're looking at doing and seeing where there's a lot of interest, but the CAC is really low. If you see a lot of interest and the CAC is really high, meaning customer acquisition costs, it's going to be very difficult to enter that business. And then once you've identified kind of a proof point that the lights are green and you should actually enter this niche. Then you can do a lot of things like fake, uh, fake front door tests. So you can build an experience where you can drive traffic, even when the site or product isn't available via Facebook ads or Google to landing pages and see if there's interest in your product before you build and spend any capital. Now, if if someone told you that, that you had to go out and start an online business today, I know you said you're entrepreneurial, but not necessarily an entrepreneur, but but in this thought experiment, say you are, what, what niche would you kind of choose and or where would you start looking for a profitable niche? Yeah, I'd probably do something like I just said, and I would look for things that are, I love consumer businesses, I've done B2B SaaS, but I would try to kind of verticalize a business that 
is horizontal. So think about things that are on eBay or Amazon or offer up areas that people are really excited about, but maybe there's a marketplace for. I look at things like collectibles and I'm always surprised at, you know, the, su- the success of Funko. My 12 year old actually has a pretty successful eBay collectible business. Unbelievably. He started that when he was nine and, and, you know, he obviously didn't go to business school at the age of nine, but you know, the, some of those principles are still there around trying to find these horizontal uh, marketplaces where there's a potential for those customers to actually have a very bespoke and personalized experience. The, that's one side. The second side is I look for companies that make a lot of money in lead gen that are getting kind of fat, dumb, and happy. So, you know, think about the macroeconomics of of the planet. Look for big trends where companies are making a lot of money on lead gen, for instance, where you could be maybe the more efficient provider. I think I still think things like healthcare, like senior healthcare, senior living, those have got to be opportunities where you can actually pr- provide better leads to these organizations and real estate properties at a more efficient customer acquisition cost. So I, I look for that, you know, like Amazon's CEO, or actually ex-CEO used to say, your margin is my opportunity. And in your opinion, what's the number one reason that small online businesses fail? Lack of focus and not differentiated enough. See it time and time again. And, you know, I, I, I think you have to be very, very uh, pedantic and very, very um, focused on where you spend your time and what you're going to say no to and what you're going to say yes to. And then differentiation. I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that fall in love with their product and they don't realize the realities that it may mean, it may not be differentiated enough if it's a service or a marketplace. I just think there's a lot of hubris around that. So being really honest with where you're focused and really honest on what you want to focus on and it's a differentiated, I think those are the things that I see as, as big failures. Now, when somebody you know gets the business identified, they've, they've identified the niche, now it's time to actually go out and make some sales. What, in your opinion, are the key components of an effective sales strategy for an online business? Word of mouth, of course, and then analytics. And so the te- having a testing methodology and a testing framework is super important. You know, I've, I've run, geez, ev- just about every vertical you could think of, ad tech, ed tech, travel, games, entertainment, and at the end of the day, it's big funnel and funnel management and analytics. And so constantly doing A-B testing, whether it's the email marketing, the copywriting, the flow on the site, constantly having a good view and a simple view of your analytics for funnel management and conversion, and then testing all the time. There's tons of opportunities to do that with free tools and or cheap tools. You mentioned word of mouth. So that begs the question of what are the best ways to build brand awareness and credibility? Once you found a niche, and I was actually a CEO of a business called ClickBank, and it was primarily an affiliate marketing marketplace, I was always surprised at all the interesting and weird verticals that somebody would get a lot of traction on. And if you're focused on a niche, then it's authenticity around that message. So getting your earned media, meaning free, uh, that could be social media, that could be PR, that could be stunts, it could be lots of different things, SEO, in addition to your marketing, having something unique and a strong perspective is the best way to do it. For example, my wife is a CEO of a company called Rock Race. Um, it's a non-alcoholic beverage. She's very focused on two or three personas, and she tests all of her Instagram and TikTok stuff real time. And she got to the point where she knows exactly how to talk to her audience and actually tested the product before she even had a product. So being really effective and having a strong point of view is the only way you can actually punch through the noise because it's so noisy right now. Do you have any marketing or advertising strategies that you find most effective for bringing in new customers? Yeah, email, I'm a huge email advocate. And so, you know, email is one of those things where a lot of companies won't focus on it enough. And I always find that there's more and more innovations, not only in the providers of that technology, but the templates, the copywriting. When you have a really good drip marketing and funnel mentality around your email, it just pays dividends. You know, we have over 12 million customers in our file uh, when I first started the company and we were never doing things like uh, top of the funnel drip marketing to introduce our brand to a customer. We were going right to transactional. And I, I find the companies that have a very good story, especially a mission-based story that helps society, that elegantly takes that customer from awareness to conversion, they do really, really well. So email, 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 I always go back to. Can you give us a sense of of what kind of 
a little bit more specifically on the email, what kind of content or messages are getting the most engagement and are the most effective at moving the customer down the funnel? Yeah, I think the the starting with the why you're doing it is the most effective. For instance, and I'll give you a couple examples. I was the president of a company called Rosetta Stone that we turned around. It was a CD-ROM based business, unbelievably, in the year 2017. And we sold it at the end of 2020. And I was a public company. We took it private. I just want to give your listeners some some context of the scale. So it was a $200 million market cap company, and we sold it for $800 million in three years. And we marketed this product like it was bargain of the basement, 1980s circular ads, if you can remember that, if anyone in your audience is that old. And what we decided to do is step back and think about the customer first, their wants and needs, their pain points, and how do we address it? And so instead of saying we are the most expensive version of Babbel or you know free as Duolingo, we said, really, we're the most effective way to learn a li- uh, you know language over the life of your language experience. And so we came up with unique messaging like binge life. And so all of the, and our products were around lifetime ownership. So all of the messaging was around, here are all the wonderful unlocks you can get related to your target language. So fun and interesting videos, fun facts about the culture, all of that starting to get the interest and the excitement around why we approach language very differently than how somebody else would. And so Rosetta Stone's key kind of pedagogy, the way it teaches language was immersion. So introducing customers through tutorials, master classes that were free that you could listen in on people learning, getting the customer understanding that it's more than just departing $199 from your credit card. It's actually improving your life. And then doing that through pretty elegant drip marketing that takes the customer through a journey of what's the value you get at the end of this journey outside of the $199. At the end of the day, you're becoming a more empowered citizen of the world. And so it was a really interesting way to bring people in. When I started Rosetta Stone, it was very much like, here's a holiday, here's the discount. And we completely changed how we talked about the business. And it was it was a quite successful turnaround. And kind of bringing it a little bit more specifically into PetMed Express um, and, and marketing there, what is what is the typical advertising budget in a given month for PetMed Express? Yeah, ranges, but you know, talking about thirty million dollars for a quarter, so a lot of money. And and where where are you finding the best ROI on that investment? So you know, there's been quite an upheaval, as you know, in the IDFA the the Apple IDFA platform changes that have impacted social. So we've seen rates go up in social and targeting go down. And I've actually seen streaming become a more important part of our media mix, um, whether it's connected TV or just straight streaming to the level almost where I'd see it work as well as performance media that's bottom of the funnel like Google. And so the shift in the social targeting I've seen is a direct impact. Uh, So I've leaned a little bit more on top of the funnel and streaming, maybe a little bit of linear TV, getting a little concerned just about the lack of visibility in social. And then, you know, Google is always kind of the the conversion at the back of the store. It's always the, the, the mainstay. And we always try, we're always the fastest at trying whatever's new for any ad platform. So I think we were one of the first retailers on Performance Max, which is kind of the the new way in which Google organizes all their media assets. So, you know, I'd tell people overall is test everything, test things that are new and be as fast as you can on any new platform and or any new initiative that platform wants to test. Because typically I find that the uh, ad platforms will give you a little bit of love because they're trying to try your product at scale, your demand at scale. And so they'll give you access to things that maybe somebody isn't working on because maybe they're a bigger company, they're slower. So streaming and then moving fast on new platform initiatives. You mentioned some of the drawbacks to social, but I do want to ask you a little bit about how how online businesses should be using social media to, in, to engage with customers. Are there specific platforms or is that is that business specific where they should be engaging? How should they be considering social as part of their marketing strategy? It, it's super important. And I was like new platforms faster, you, you know, unbelievably pet meds. When I started, it was probably one of the most unoptimized businesses I've seen in terms of its marketing strategy. Not a lot of people focused on marketing and not a lot of people understanding some of the new platforms. I mean, unbelievably, we actually had a friend of mine actually grab my TikTok account, pet meds, <laughs> and said, hey, how much do you want for it? And they gave it to me for free. But that's kind of gives you a sense of where we started. What we have decided to do in social is really try to mirror 
what the core intrinsic value is for pet meds in the media. What I mean by that specifically is our customers view their pets as their children. I know I do. I have Harry's barking behind me somewhere. You can probably hear him. And so the humanization of pets is a really big theme for us. And so we've, a lot of our social media now is really about the inside thoughts of pets. That's actually become our, our linear and streaming creative as well. So you kind of get a sense of the humanization of the pet. It's funny. And also we layer in an influencer that we decided to spend a bunch of time with. And I, I do like using influencers, but not spending a lot of money on them. I've had a lot of success with an influencer that I would call a small to mid tier influencer, say a hundred thousand followers on TikTok or Instagram, because they're more niche and they're going to work a lot harder than, you know, somebody who's a celebrity where you're paying a lot of money for. Audiences really want authenticity. And so we have this one influencer, Dr. Lindsay, who's an actual vet near our office in Florida, who's got a phenomenal personal story and a love for pets. And um, that really rings true. And that's those two things have been successful. So kind of understanding kind of the core persona wants and needs. And so, that, you know, doggy diaries and inside voices of pets, but also overlaying an influencer that has a real legitimate following that provides pet health expert information and then being consistent. Don't view it as something you have to do on a schedule. View it as something as related to something that makes sense to your audience. And what's something that that a lot of online companies get wrong about social media marketing and what what should they be doing instead? Yeah, I think it's the lack of authenticity. I think most companies, well, here, a couple things. One is I'm not a big fan of hiring expensive ad agencies. I like boutique ad agencies, boutique creative providers. You can find them. It's easier than ever to find them. There's so many platforms where you can find one or two people in the Ukraine or Croatia that has some unique insight or a very small agency that's going to work really hard for your business. If you're very, very small and don't want to hire people focused on this and you're a single person entrepreneur and working really hard, I'd find someone that's very boutique, very small, and maybe willing to work for performance as well. And then past that, the authenticity component, you know it when you see it. For example, in the non-alcoholic beverage space where my wife spends a lot of her time, I'll never forget this ad. It was a product called Bitter Housewife. And they actually, in one of their ads, has a testimonial that says, this is the worst product I've ever seen. I hate the taste. I hate everything about it. And th- th- there was more to it. But the, the punchline of the ad was, this is not the product for everybody. But for the people that like this product, they absolutely love it. If or X, Y, and Z. And I remember thinking, my God, that is the most interesting, authentic way to market your product. So I think having a strong point of view and, and, and lacking the corporate piece, people know it when a big company agency has you know their quote unquote magical authenticity people smell it out. So I'd try to go small, stay close to the brand, stay close to the customer and take the veneer of that corporate BS out of your your creative. So this is going to bring us to a section of the show we call our, our fan blitz questions. These come from our YouTube community. You can go to youtube.com slash upflip and find us there and uh, join the community and you can pose questions to future podcast guests. So Matt, we're going to try and get through about seven questions in about two to two and a half minutes. So here we go. If you could change one thing about your business, what would it be? More faster. What's the biggest misconception people have about your position? That CEOs have the answers for everything. We don't know everything. At this stage of success, what advice would you give to your teenage self? Two things. More patience, Matt. And secondly, it really doesn't matter. Don't worry so much about people's opinions about you. They're not really thinking about you as much as you think about yourself. Give us the business secret which makes me a billionaire. Say no to most things 95% of the time. If there was a movie made about your journey, what would the title be? Two, Don't Back Down, I guess it would be Tom Petty's theme song, and or The Eclectic Life of Matt Hewlett. That would be directed by Wes Anderson. Oh, man, I can't wait. That's going to be my new favorite Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> um, if, if you could have anyone in this world endorse your business, who would it be and why? Probably not the appropriate for our persona, primarily women in our in our platform but Ryan Reynolds I think he's the best celebrity marketer best marketer ever I just love I just love him yeah I would agree completely with that last question here if aliens take over tomorrow how would you convince them to let you keep running the business I tell them that pets need to stay healthy because they're a good distraction for the humans that you're about to rule over <laughs> <laughs> 
True, 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 true. That Those are our Fan Blitz questions. Uh, again, those come from the YouTube community. Join us over on YouTube. Join the community, post questions for future podcast guests, and also check out all the great interviews there with more entrepreneurs and business leaders. Matt, a few more questions from me, though. I want to talk about systems and, and standard operating procedures. What should an online business have in place from the beginning, and why are those critical systems to have? If you're running a larger business, I would still say you have to get your hands dirty. And so I still do my own survey monkeys. I still do my own MailChimp on personal stuff that I do. I still have purchased ads for my wife's business, not particularly well, but I like to stay in it. And I'm the CEO of a public company. So just because you're a CEO and you may not be the individual contributor towards a specific function doesn't mean that you can't understand these things. It's so easy now. So a good e com stack. You know, everyone, you know, has their favorite. I'd say, you know, you go to Shopify, you use the best email program. I'm a big fan of MailChimp. You have a really good payment provider. And for subscription-based businesses, make sure you're you're way on top of that, whether you use someone like Zora or a payment provider that has really good auto updating for credit cards. I mean, the simple little things I've seen in business, like not having an account updater when somebody's credit card expires, it's, it's lost money. Those are the most basic things. And then I would try to find some lightweight, really good analytics stack. We use Looker, um, which is a Google product in addition to Google Analytics. But, you know, having some ability to, you know, for lack of, this is oversimplification, if you can do pivot tables real time on your business, you're, you're, you're almost there to having, you know, a big team behind you. So those are some of the basics. Again, don't try to come up with something exotic. There are so many products out there that are free or very cheap. And last thing, if you're doing shipping-based products, doing drop ship or doing a lot of shipping throughput, Shippo is a great product. It's just a great API to integrate with your different shipping providers, and it saves you a lot of time as a very small business. Wow, lots of lots of really great um, pieces of advice nestled in that. Thank you for that thorough answer because it was very useful. Can you share with us an effective strategy for scaling revenue as an online business? Well, first thing is, and, and these things sound simple. I used to, earlier in my career, I used to answer questions with, it was kind of like, Matt, what time is it? And I'd spend about an hour explaining how to build the watch because I thought it was really interesting to explain how it worked. At the end of the day, I think with this question in mind, I'm shocked at how any size business, and this is public, private, super small, super big, they don't understand their unit economics. And so you have to understand your e unit economics very precisely. So if you have an LTV calculation, lifetime value, make sure you understand exactly what that LTV calculation is. Is it based on historical? Are you doing front LTV? What are your COGS? You know, your cost of goods sold? What is your CAC? What does your repeat base look like? Have that calculus all the time. That seems super obvious to most people. You would be shocked. So growing your revenue is consistently thinking through your unit economics and building a model so that you have enough cash flow to profitably finance the next marginal customer. And so in the affiliate world, I used to run into affiliate marketers that all the time would run out of money, but they had $10 million businesses because they didn't have enough funds to finance the next tranche of, of customers. Conversely, I've seen people underfund their businesses because they just didn't have the expertise to think through um, how to purchase media and demand. And so in general, a long winded way is understand your union economics, have a perspective of how much of your, how fast you want to grow your business. What are your goals? I'd start with a three-year goal, three, two, and one. If a three-year is what I'd like to be, two years is what I, I, I should be, and then the first year would be, this is absolutely what I need to be. And then when you think about growing your revenue, think about the mix of inorganic and organic. So how much demand do you want to spend on any of the marketing channels? And how much do you really want to focus on organic growth? You know, personally, my bias is if you're an e-commerce business, it's going to be hard to grow just organically. So you're going to have to obviously have a mix of, of paid media. I don't like to see businesses over 50% paid as a personal bias. And the reason for that is you have to incrementally spend more and more money every quarter and it just gets harder over time. So having a good perspective of, and a portfolio perspective of how you want to grow your demand, whether it's it's paid um, or free earned traffic is, is a good way to look at it and have some unique economic sense and then understand what your sales go goals are. The tools come later. That's easy. There's tons of people that will sell you tools. It's understanding your business priorities and your unit economics, which will really help you. 
you know, uh, not understanding the numbers seems like one one potential impediment for for growth as a small business. But what are some of the other common impediments to that growth, and what should business owners be doing to overcome those? The classic is, you know, I'm, I'm famously always taking over companies, and there's usually a founder there, and the fa- founders are slightly insane, and I mean that affectionately. Well, you know, it, it takes a very special person to look at a problem that we don't even know exists yet, or a solution that we can't even fathom. And you work on it for a prolonged period of time and not listen to most people that tell you you're going to fail. I mean, that is a very special person. Those people, though, typically do not delegate through people and they can't manage people because everything they did in the beginning of the company is perfect to them and they can do everything. And I continually talk to founders that say, you know, they'll look at me in the eye and say, no, 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 Matt, I can be a great manager. I'm like, great. What's your next hire look like? And how? what's the metric to hire your next person? Well, Matt, that doesn't matter. I actually am the best at direct email and I can buy media. So I don't even need to hire those people. I'm like, wait a minute, let's slow down. If you want to grow from 1 million to 10, you know, there's not enough hours in the day for you to do all these functions. And so I find that founders have a really hard time to delegate and a really hard time to think through how to scale through people. That's a very interesting transition because I do want to ask you kind of about about the workforce at Pet, Pet Med Express. Um, so I guess just to give us a little bit of context, what was employee headcount when you came in as the CEO and, and where is it at today? Yeah, it's, it's almost about the same. I mean, we are a really a shockingly small business for a public company. So business is doing two, 70 to $280 million a year around there only have about 220 employees. We've only grown maybe by 10 employees over the last year. And revenue per headcount, EBITDA per headcount, probably the highest for any Russell 3000 company. And and why is that? Why is that is because when I do transformations, turnarounds, there's typically, especially public companies, investors want results fast, although they'll tell you that they're long-term thinkers. But I realized that this labor market, I can't hire people fast enough that will have zero defects. Like, you know, it's very hard to find the right person that will be successful in a turnaround. And so what we decided to do in, instead is hire some new team members, but really good at hub and spoke. So I hire someone who's really good at something like our CTO. He's really good at operations, IT and tech. But we have kind of this variable mentality where we actually have teams in India, Croatia, some in New York, where we can spin up and spin down systems engineers or data warehouse analytics people. And these are teams that are virtualized. They're part of our team, but we don't have the time to onboard and hire them. And so we've kind of cultivated over time. I would remember the old show, A-Team. There was a movie, I guess, more recently. We have kind of the A-Team. We bring in the A-Team. So our headcount probably won't grow. Our dollars will increase on consulting and contracting dollars. And that's, that's the quickest, fastest way for us to think scrappy. And most businesses, in fact, I think if someone was listening and said, they sound a little bit like my small business and they're $270 million, I think that's the point is, I believe the best run businesses, even at massive, massive, massive scale, should have small teams and run like a startup. And Amazon's the best example. So for for me, I'm not gonna increase my dedicated fixed head count that much. I'm certainly gonna increase the amount of people around our business on a variable basis. When you do have an opening on, on that A-team and you are looking to bring somebody in what is what does the hiring process look like? How are you going out and and recruiting in the the labor market as it is? It's tough, and one of the one of the main jobs that you have if you're a founder listening or a business owner, CEO running a unit business unit, no matter who you are and what stage of business, you have to be either raising money all the time. <laughs> And your main job as CEO is to not run out of money and get the money. And two is always be recruiting. And so I look in LinkedIn personally, probably two to three hours a week, just myself doing passive recruiting. I also have a couple of firms that I use that are really scrappy that allow me to get a large group of candidates from a passive perspective, meaning they're not looking for work. And I I look through those candidates all the time with our HR group. And so I think about what do I need 12 months from now in terms of potential headcount or team member? I hate that term, headcount, team member. I work back and think, well, it's going to take me six months to kind of cultivate a relationship, take me about three months to close them and three months to be effective. So you think about long lead sales cycles on people, you're always recruiting and uh, I use a service called Rockstar Recruiting, which is a really cheap and ineffective way to find really good talent. So you're always looking at talent. They're always in, in your system. 
and you're always having conversations with them, even if you're not trying to hire them. I, for example, it took me two years in a previous uh, job to, to close somebody that was very pivotal to my turnaround. And if you take a long-term view on talent, they also know that you're building a relationship with them and they're more likely to work with you and feel like partners with you than you know a typical command and control relationship with your manager. I want to take that that long-term thinking and start looking at broader goals for the business. How do you go about setting smart goals for the business? What are this what are the steps that you take? I have a three-year plan, kind of a five-year financial model, and those are kind of aspirational. But how you kind of operate operationalize them for the year is I use the Salesforce framework called V2Mom, visions, values, obstacles, measures and methods. And what that does is it frames out in a very simple one pager, what are the things you're going to focus on, you know, what, and what do you aspire to be? And then being really honest about the obstacles in your way. So I take that framework, I usually, I do an annual plan and then I, I divide it into quarters and then I put it in a Google sheet. I'm just being really, really specific because it doesn't have to be harder than this. We put it in quarters. There's usually four or five tabs. For example, one is usually financials. One is probably employees. The other is probably product. You have those tabs. Everyone in the company can see it. And then you have the key initiatives that are color-coded with the specific metrics that you want to hit. And then if they're color-coded red or yellow and they're important, obviously certain things that were important that aren't, that are being worked on have to be not worked on so you can focus on those things. So it's breaking things down into quarters, being transparent about those, and then that's reinforced on the weekly one-on-ones and the weekly staff meeting. And so we're constantly looking at that and making, I, I'm a big fan in essence of process goals versus having a goal like I want to lose weight in three months versus I'm going to actually reduce my caloric intake every day to this. That's a process goal. So the same thing with companies, V2 mom, the vision, the values, the methods, the obstacles, the metrics, breaking it down into quarters, putting in Google Sheets so everyone can see it. and then consistently looking at that as a group every week so that we hit those objectives and those initiatives, or if we're not, we're able to course correct. You have been uh, fixing and growing businesses for more than 30 years. What's one thing that that was perhaps good advice when you got started 30 years ago, but is no longer true? And what should business leaders be doing instead of that received wisdom? That's a really good question. I think in other words, I'm old. I'm 52 now. I can't believe I'm 52. <laughs> is um, I don't feel 52. It was kind of a Reagan era style of management, the Je- Iron Jack Welch, Ronald Reagan era, Gordon Gecko, Greed is Good era from when I was young. And I, I've been in the software tech business forever, lots of different verticals. But there's kind of this notion that, well, two things. One is, you know, try to get really good at something you're not good at. And I don't get a sense that that works. I don't do that. I wouldn't suggest that anyone does that. And I think there's enough good advice from, you know, I like Mark Cuban personally, um, his advice or Gary V. But, you, you know, focus on what you're good at and then you build a team around you that complements what you're not good at. I think that's kind of the prevailing advice now. When I was younger, it was kind of like take your brain and slam rote learning into it and try to get good at that, although you don't like it. And I'm dyslexic. And uh, I only found out I was dyslexic when I was older and I explained a lot. And so me, getting me really good at reading really quickly was very difficult. And I'm pretty good now. But I wouldn't do that. I'd focus on what you're good at and then find people around you that complements that. And then the other thing I would say is there was a big focus on when I was younger being focused on certain types of roles you know, brands, whether it's, uh, I want to, you know, go to school at a branded university, like a Yale or Harvard, or work at a branded company for long periods of time. I think today, obviously, with the, the great resignation, more remote first working, I think it's really a good time for anyone who's earlier in their career to be what I call uncompromisingly true to what you want to do. The ability for you to kind of try lots of different things early in your career is something I'd always advise. And you typically would get advice when in my era, that looks like you're schizophrenic or you don't have grip. I actually think the other way around is if you're at a job for a year or two, you're just collecting data. I mean, maybe when you're in your 40s and 50s and you see this behavior, you got to start scratching your head. But if you moved from 
an ad agency to a startup to a big company, and every one to two years, you're getting a, a wide swath of skills and experiences. I think that's really valuable. So those are the two things is, you know, don't focus on things you're not good at, and then don't compromise what you want to do. Make sure you focus on those things. You mentioned a few different business leaders that that some some people would describe as effective, and I think in, in some ways you were describing them as well. But I'm curious what you think kind of the key traits of an effective business leader are. Yeah, and it changes over time. So when you start out in your career, it's individual contributor based and um, intellectual IQ is an aptitude experience is super important. When you're later in your career as a, a bit scale business leader, it's really about empowering people, not telling people how to do their job, tell them what you want, and then enable them to be empowered to do it, making really good decisions. And not just the decisions that we all think about today is which decisions actually matter and how many decisions should you be making. So, you know, I try to make not a lot of decisions anymore, but the ones I make are super important. You got to think through those. That's kind of the prefrontal cortex answer. The flip side, I'm a heart and math person on the heart side is I think for anything that you do, and I hope this is true for anyone listening, is you have empathy for your customer and you have empathy for your for your employees. If you don't choke up when you acknowledge someone's promotion or someone coming into your company or a customer problem and you don't feel that, you know, either you're psychotic or you should be doing something different. So empathy and then passion. So I think Daniel Pink wrote a great book many years ago called Drive. What drives people? And his conclusion was autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so if you can provide people with passion and purpose, people will run through walls. And one of our core attributes at Pet Meds is we have six, two through concrete. And it was uttered by one of our customer service supervisors. And he looked at me the first week I was there and he said, Matt, I want to be real clear with you. We're excited that you're here. And I will personally run through concrete until this company is successful again. And so passion and purpose, that's the jet fuel. The scaled effectiveness of leaders is finding the right people, empowering them and making really smart decisions and not that many. What would you describe as one of your your biggest mistakes as a business leader and how did you recover from it? And what what were some of the key lessons that you learned from the experience? The good news is I've never made a mistake. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I've made tons of mistakes. Um, I think the biggest, some of the biggest ones is around people. I would say that on the people side, um, you have to be slow to hire and fast to fire. And earlier in my career, and it's difficult to do that, by the way, when you're emotionally invested in somebody, either because you like them for a long period of time or a short period of time, or the business has changed, they've done nothing wrong. The business fundamentally is bigger than it was. This person is having trouble. Understanding that and reacting to it and doing something about that, you know, the hardest thing to do. But if you don't do it, your business is going to suffer and your team sees that and the person's team sees that. So that's the biggest. The other thing I would say is in terms of deployment of capital, spending too much money on things without testing them first. So I used to say the cardinal sin if you're working with software development teams is you build products that no one wants. There's no excuse for that anymore. So I would say, you know, overbuilding or overinvesting in something, whether it's a big marketing program or project development cycle or something without actually doing some agile testing and, and validation. Those are the two people and, and kind of overinvesting. If there was one one thing that you wanted people to take away from this interview, what would it be? I'd say be uncom- uncompromisingly true to what you want to do. I think I think that's my big message. Too many people are so focused on people's perceptions of themselves. And you know, as long as you have the right support group thinking, there's no excuse to not listen to great podcasts like this. There's no excuse to not do continual learning. There's no excuse to not read about the biographies of great business leaders. As long as you're kind of open to the feedback and you're realistic about your chances at whatever you're professional careers in front of you, whether it's something that you're a job or a new business, just be uncompromising about what you want to do because, you know, work takes up majority of our life and gives us the majority of our purpose. So that that's my main advice. Last question here. What's your favorite business book and why? I love this book. I would say Thorndike's book. It's called The Outsiders. It does a great it's a counterintuitive view of what makes a successful CEO. And the thesis is the best CEOs aren't CEOs with big personalities. They're actually great capital allocators. 
and it goes chapter by chapter with some of the best capital allocators of our generation. And I just love this book. And it's it's so refreshing because we've read so much about the big personalities. We all know who they are. But this one is about really the, the people that deliver the huge IRR are the quiet ones, the smart ones, and the ones that understand how to deploy their capital correctly. That is going to do it for this episode of the Upflip podcast. Again, listeners, go check out the Upflip blog for more actionable advice on starting and growing a business or head over to the Upflip YouTube channel for more interviews with successful business leaders. Matt Hewlett, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It was a true, true pleasure.